Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see you all. We are glad you're here this morning. Um, it is just always, always a joy to come into this place and to see you and to know that we are here to hear a word from our Heavenly Father and to spend time in His presence. So we're going to pray. We're going to start this thing off and uh, just spend some time with our, with our God today. Let's bow together. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for this day. Uh, God, we just thank you for the rain. And Father, we just ask right now that you would be with us here today as we spend time at your feet. Uh, we just pray that you would draw us close to you. God, let us lift you up here in this place today. Uh, and as your word promises, if we lift you up, men will be drawn to you. And so we just pray that that happens here and now. It's why we've come today is to lift you up and to be drawn to you. Speak to our hearts today, God, through everything that we do. God, through our, our worship time, God, through our songs, through our prayers, through our time in your word. God, just draw us near and speak to hearts here today. We pray that you would change lives because of the word that you bring us today. Father, we love you. God, we are here for you. We pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let's lift up our voices together. We're going to spend some time just coming to the feet of the cross and praising our God. This one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love.
comes out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm
Jesus continues bringing glory to his name. Worshiping the God who is here and now in this room today with us and who is the same God that was with Moses, the same God that was with Abraham, the same God that was with Adam, the same God that was with David, the same God that was with all of Jesus' disciples, apostles. That same God is here in this place today. We are here to celebrate him and his presence in our lives and the power that he can bring to you and to me to change our lives. Let's lift him up. I'm calling on the God of Jacob love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses the one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same
free the captives then you're freeing hearts right now you are the same god you are the same god you touch the lepers then i feel your touch right now you are the same god you are the same god Calling on the Holy Spirit, Almighty River, come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. Let's bow together. God, we are calling on you here and now. God, that song, I believe, is so true for people in this room, God. I don't know what anyone's need in this room is specifically, but God, I know that we all need you, and we all need you to do a work in our life, and we need you here, and we need you now. God, I pray that for everyone in this room, God, you would speak to us with the words and the encouragement and the life change that we need here today. God, we are here for you. We love you. We just give ourselves to you. We ask you to do a work in our lives. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Good morning to each of you. We are so glad you are here today, and we are honored to welcome those in the room with us. We welcome those who are watching online. It's our privilege to worship together. We know we have guests with us each time we gather, and so we would love to get to know you personally. If you are our guest and you are watching online, you'll see a QR code. If you're sitting in one of these chairs, you'll look in the chair in front of you. You will see a QR code. You can click on that. And it will take you to a place where you can give us just a bit of your information so we can welcome you and say hello. If you have a worship guide here in the room and you'd like to write it on this tear-off slip, you can do the same thing. A bit of your information, drop it in one of the offering boxes in this room or in the hallways so we can say hello to you and tell you a little bit more about our church. We would love to do that. Also, the tear-off slip allows us to pray with you. If you would like to write something on this prayer slip, you can use the email address prayer at firstmelissa.com or at the very end of our worship service, we will have members of our prayer team right here at the stage and they would love to pray with you personally. Inside the worship guide, you will see a whole bunch of things going on in our ministries. It is getting to the time of year. It'll be Thanksgiving, it'll be Hanukkah, it'll be Christmas, all kinds of things we'll be talking about as we go forward. You can start to place some things on your calendar. And as we look ahead to this week, we will gather on Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. right here in this room. We have a great new study. We just started our annual reading calendar on the book of Genesis. And we would love to have you join us Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Wednesday evenings, we have ministries at 6.30 p.m. for all different age groups, different classes for adults, great things for our teenagers and our kids. There's a dinner at 5.30 if you register in advance for that. And if you came in by the front doors, you will notice, and if you're leaving that way, you'll notice we have a display set up. It is time to take the next step in our Christmas Angels ministry, as we've been talking about for several weeks 
We've been receiving nominations for families who might need a little help this Christmas. And now the next step is we get to adopt families. You adopt one person or a family, whatever you choose. All the information is at the table. You might also choose to fill a grocery box. And the box is there with the shopping list inside. So you can choose to adopt a family, fill a grocery box, do one or the other, both, whatever you choose. But the table is set up in the foyer and they'll help you get all the information you need. So thank you for helping us bless our neighbors during this Christmas season. We have a lot more ministries going on. Hope you'll pay attention to our mobile app and our worship guide. But everything we do here, we do together as the body of believers. We sing and we study and we pray and we volunteer and we give. As fellow followers of Jesus, we give of our tithes and offerings. I mentioned the offering boxes in this room and in the hallways. Some prefer to give by cash or check. If you prefer that, those are what the boxes are for. Many choose to give electronically. It's very simple. FirstMelissa.com slash give, whatever method you choose. Thank you for giving to ministry, joining with us as we all do our part together to tell the story of Jesus. And this morning we're going to continue a conversation we began last Sunday titled, In God We Trust. We're talking about what our nation is talking about. We have an election coming up on Tuesday of this week. Our nation is going to choose the next leader for our country. But no matter who is elected in the White House, in the Senate, in the Congress, as judges, no matter who's elected, please understand that our trust is not in a person who's elected to office. In God we trust. That's what we're talking about. We told you last week that the national motto for our nation, it became in God we trust officially in 1956 when President Eisenhower signed a law into, signed a bill into law making in God we trust our national motto. And we began this conversation last week and we're going to Look back a little bit and continue forward today. I want to remind you that our political leaders are found in Washington and Austin. And our laws are made in Washington and Austin, our nation's capital and our state capital. But our salvation is not found in Washington and Austin. Our hope is not found there. Our purpose in life is not found in either one of those places. Because our Savior is greater than those who are in Washington and in Austin. Our hope lies at the cross of Jesus. Our hope lies in an eternity with the Savior. And the reason we need to talk about this as a church is because this is what America's talking about. This is what America's facing over the last few weeks. And probably the next few weeks, this is what America's talking about. And one of the pastors that we respect, his name is Jim Dennison, and he wrote an article this week, and he said that there are feelings of stress throughout America. He writes that more than 69% of Americans say they are stressed over this week's presidential election. He gives five reasons. Number one, our elections are longer and more expensive than ever before. Nowhere else in the world, in case you don't study geopolitics in other countries, nowhere else in the world do you have people running for office for years on end. But we do. And so we've heard about this forever and ever. So much money is spent on advertising that you can't get away from it. Over 70% of Americans are concerned about election violence and the future of democracy. Pastor Dennison says that trust in the media to report election news fairly and accurately has fallen to an all-time low. Three-fourths of Americans are worried about the future of our nation and the economy. And last, nearly half of all voters are skeptical that self-governance is working in America today. So this is a stressor on our nation. It's a stressor on our citizens. But the scripture says a lot about this topic. And we need to see what God's word has to say. So I told you last week, this series is for... Followers of Jesus, those who love politics, those who hate politics, 
those who are involved in politics, those who ignore politics. This series is for followers of Jesus who want to understand God's word regarding these matters. And when you are told that politics and your faith can never intersect, that you are to keep them separated, that's a misunderstanding of the Bible. I want to show you an excerpt from an article on the screen, and I'm going to read it to you. The Bible contains numerous examples of God's people engaging in politics as part of a holistic approach to ministry that meets both spiritual and temporal needs. Joseph and Daniel served in foreign administrations and used their influence to implement policies that benefited society. In the case of Joseph, during a devastating famine, we read about it in the book of Genesis, God used his position in the Egyptian government to protect, protect and provide for his extended family, which would become the nation of Israel. Queen Esther, in the famous story, used her influence in the Persian government, that's Iran today, to save the Jewish people from a state-sanctioned genocide. The prophet Jeremiah instructed the exiles in Babylon to seek the welfare of their new city. He commanded them to pray for the city, for in its welfare you will find your welfare a thriving society would benefit God's people as well as the city's other inhabitants. Because government and its laws are an inextricable part of our lives, there is no way to avoid some level of involvement. This is true for Christians, who though sojourners and exiles in this world are nevertheless citizens of the city of man as well as the city of God. Christians ought to endeavor to be good citizens of both cities, and leverage their influence for the advancement of laws, policies, and practices that contribute to the flourishing of our neighbors. And one more statement from this article. Because power resides with the people in our republic, when Christians vote, they are delegating their ruling authority to others. By voting, Christians are entrusting their sword-bearing responsibility to officials who will govern on their behalf. Voting is a matter of stewardship. Failure to vote is a failure to exercise God-given authority. Given the United States' far-reaching influence in the world, how can American Christians love the people of the nations well without having a vested interest in how our government approaches the issues of religious liberty and human rights worldwide? Will America's ambassadors be stalwart defenders of religious freedom overseas? Christians who support missionaries should care about the state of international religious freedom, an area of advocacy in which the U.S. exerts significant influence. Will abortion, under the euphemism of family planning, be funded overseas by American taxpayers? Or will U.S. foreign policy value the life of the unborn? Again, American believers, by exercising their right to vote, have a direct say in these matters. Compelled by love for our neighbors and a desire to steward our God-given responsibilities, we must, as Christians, engage in the political process. But we must engage biblically. This requires that we be prepared to grapple with the moral issues of our day, the reality of our two-party system, and follow our Christian convictions to their logical end by voting for candidates and parties that support clear biblical values. This article reminds us that we can't avoid this topic as much as we would want to. Our nation needs believers to make their biblical voice heard. Other nations need believers in America to make their biblical voices heard. So we're going to talk about a lot of things today, but remember what I asked you last week, what do we do first the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. As we told you last week, if we are praying for our leaders, we won't have the time or the desire to adore them or hate them or ridicule them or ignore them. Because we're focused on praying for them. So before we go any further, 
I want us to pray for our leaders and our nation right now. Please bow. God, we again lift up all those who are in office, all those who are running for office, the one who will be the next president, the one who will be in the Senate and the Congress, state legislature, local leaders. God, I pray that they will be called to a true walk with Jesus. They will be called to stand courageously and boldly for biblical truth, compassion, concern for those who are hurting, honesty, and everything that comes from your word. Father, we pray for our nation that not just we in this church or we who profess faith in Jesus would understand that leaders are fallible and sinful and there's only one king and his name is Jesus. And we pray this prayer in his name, amen. I'm gonna ask us to keep in mind Philippians chapter three. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Many are citizens of America in this room. Some are not. Some are. Most are. But if you're a follower of Jesus, no matter your nationality, your ultimate citizenship is in heaven. That's why in Colossians 1 we read, He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, our citizenship is in heaven and our King is named Jesus. No matter what political party you belong to, no matter what nationality you are, if you have received the gift of salvation, your citizenship is in heaven and your king is named Jesus. With that background, we still have an election and we still have a nation in turmoil. And so we have these persistent questions. For followers of Jesus whose ultimate citizenship is in heaven... What is the biblical mandate regarding human government? What did God say about human government? Because please understand, it was his creation. He designed it. And what does God, through his word, instruct us regarding earthly leaders? We're going to look at several passages today. First, from the book of Romans. If you'll find your way, please, to the middle of your New Testament, that second part of your Bible. We're going to look at some verses from Romans chapter 12 and chapter 13, and then we'll look at a few other passages as we go forward. We're going to start in Romans 12, verse 1, which is not going to sound like a political verse because it's not. Romans 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes to believers in a city that had ungodly leaders, the city of Rome. And he said, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. The apostle Paul is a Jew. He's writing to fellow Jews who all would understand the sacrificial system. There's no temple in Jerusalem today, so there's no Jewish sacrificial system in the temple, there's no temple. But there was in the days of Jesus, there was in the days of Paul, and for centuries before that. And they would have understood what a sacrifice is. You bring your very best to the Lord and you lay it at the altar. And sometimes that was money, sometimes it was grain, sometimes it was an animal. The animal that would have been slaughtered for this purpose. Paul says he's encouraging his brothers, his Christian fellow believers, to present your bodies, our bodies, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Before we talk about anything else, Paul says, you give yourself to God. Before you pray for a leader, before you talk about government policy, give yourself to God, a living and holy sacrifice. 
And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We mentioned earlier that America's political system is different than everywhere else in the world, where people run for president for years, and campaign commercials are out there for years You're inundated by mail, by social media, by television commercials, and it all soaks into our mind. And the Apostle Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. All of that mess is not what should be guiding my mind, but my mind should be transformed. How is my mind renewed? It's by putting in the things of God, not the things of the world. The input is different. So that I might prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. And then in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about spiritual gifts. How that we all have gifts from the Lord as followers of Jesus that are used for his glory. And then we'll read in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Now, since we're talking about politics, we as followers of Jesus need to stand up for truth. We need to call what is right, right, and we need to call what is wrong, wrong, no matter what political party is involved. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Holy is holy. Evil is evil. Doesn't matter what political party it is. If we call one group evil and one group good when they're both evil, you know what that is? That's hypocrisy. We need to say what is biblically true and righteous and what is not. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. All of these things are what we do during an election season if we're following Jesus. But you know what? These are the things we do when it's not election season if we're following Jesus. And devoted to prayer. There's a lot of believers praying about an election right now, but I've been convinced over the last few weeks we need to commit not just to pray about who's going to take office, we need to pray about the people when they're in office. That they would seek the Savior. It continues in 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Verse 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. In Deuteronomy 32. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When we talk about elections, we talk about politics, one thing that people say all the time is it's a dirty game. And it is. But we don't have to live that way. We don't have to talk that way. We can choose... To overcome evil with good. And that leads us to Romans 13. The Apostle Paul says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. To the higher authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. 
People are in positions of leadership at every level of government, from the mayor of a city to the president of the United States, only because God allowed it to happen. Nobody in this room knows who's going to win the election on Tuesday. Nobody does. But the all-knowing God of the universe is fully aware of who's going to win the election on Tuesday. And people are only in positions of power, says the book of Romans, because God allowed it. There's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. We have the biblical mandate to respect those in political leadership. To subject ourselves to authorities. Now I know that's going to lead to a lot of questions. And I'm going to try to answer them in a moment. But this is not an optional statement given in the scriptures. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Well, who is the ultimate authority in America? I have another quote for you. In the United States, the ultimate authority for government is vested in the citizens. According to the U.S. Constitution, that means God has appointed us as citizens to exercise authority properly as service to him and to others. That would mean that our job as citizens is to play our proper role in upholding a standard of loving our neighbors as ourselves and insisting on a government that reflects biblical values for government. God's direction for maximum human flourishing is in creating a self-governing society. The pillars of self-governance are rule of law, consent of the governed, and private those are biblical principles. The next verse in Romans 13, verse 3 says, Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For it, governmental leaders, governmental authority, it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it... Government, leaders, government, it does not bear the sword, the ability to punish for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath or punishment on the one who practices evil. So every one of us benefits from a government that protects those who do right and punishes those who do wrong. Every citizen benefits when government works that way. And then you ask, but what if the governmental leaders are evil? And look at William Newell's quote. Your savior suffered under Pontius Pilate, one of the worst Roman governors Judea ever had, and Paul under Nero, the worst Roman emperor. And neither our Lord nor his apostle denied or reviled the authority. See, you might dislike our leaders today, but we're not the first generation who's disliked their leaders. We're not the first generation of followers of Jesus who had leaders who did ungodly things. Yet the Apostle Paul who's writing this lived under a terribly evil Roman emperor. And Jesus the Messiah lived under Pontius Pilate who was egotistical and power hungry and lived an unrighteous or an immoral life. So the Bible is written by people who've lived what they're talking about. Verse 5 of Romans 13, therefore it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath but also for conscience sake. See you don't do this just to stay out of punishment, you do it because it's the right thing to do. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom. This is like a toll or a tariff in our modern vocabulary. Fear or reverence to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Modern people today complaining about high taxes. It's not a new problem. It's thousands of years old. Do what is right because it's the right thing to do, he says. 
Another quote, Paul's idea is that Christians should be the best citizens of all. Even though they are loyal to God before they are loyal to the state, Christians are good citizens because they are honest, give no trouble to the state, pay their taxes, and most importantly, pray for the state and the rulers. Paul says in verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loved his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Remember the parts of the Ten Commandments. He said, if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 11, do this knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Paul wrote this letter almost 2,000 years ago. And he says, every day we get closer to the return of the Savior. And it's a fact, right? I mean, tomorrow's closer than today, but we're 2,000 years later than he was. Salvation is nearer to us than the day when we believed. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Remember what we read earlier, let love be without hypocrisy. I, as a follower of Jesus, cannot complain about immoral politicians if I lead an immoral life. Make no provision for the flesh. This is what Paul wrote in Romans 13. Now, if you have your scriptures, we're going to go a little further back in the New Testament to the book of Titus for a couple of verses because he writes the very similar thing. Titus chapter 3. Paul says remind them. And the way the verb tense works in the Greek is means keep on reminding them. Remind them repeatedly to be subject to rulers. To authorities. To be obedient. To be ready for every good deed. This means to do good stuff, not just wait around and hope the bad stuff stops. It's to be active, not passive. To be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. To malign no one. The literal Greek word is blaspheme. No one. To be peaceable, gentle, Showing every consideration for all men. So this is a different letter written by the Apostle Paul at different times, different circumstances. But his principle is the same. Be subject to those who are in authority. Be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. But when we keep reading, subject yourselves to the authorities on earth, we still have this nagging set of questions. What if the government decrees are unbiblical? What if human government does not espouse God's values? And this is a legitimate set of questions. And believers have been asking this for thousands of years. Believers today are asking this question. But we need to be careful when we ask this question because we tend to over-apply these questions. The tax rate should be this or that. Zoning should be this or that. Those are hard to defend biblically. Some things are right and wrong. Some things are just government policy. And you can like them or dislike them. You just can't argue against them with biblical scriptures. But when we're talking about things of right and wrong, what if the government decrees are unbiblical? What if human government does not espouse God's values? Are we still supposed to subject ourselves to the authorities of God that he has placed on the earth, the human leaders? Let's read a story. Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to read. Some of you know the story. We're going to read it quickly. Two of Jesus' apostles, after he has been resurrected, after he ascends to heaven, he's no longer on the earth. Two of his apostles are named Peter and John, two of his very closest friends. The book of Acts chapter 4 says they, Peter and John, were speaking to the people. 
the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them. That means they arrested them, put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed. And the number of men came to be about 5,000. 5,000 men came to faith in Jesus because of the witnessing, the preaching of Peter and John. Well, the authorities didn't like it and threw them in jail. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there. And Caiaphas and John and Alexander, those were leaders in the priestly class. And all of them were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, like in the place of of, uh, judgment or accusation, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, see we're reading Acts 4, that happened back in Acts 3, a man was healed. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He... Yeshua, Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. It's a messianic prophecy from Psalm 118. And then Peter says, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And if you've been around the church for a while, you've heard Acts 4.12 mentioned often. And it's very true. There's no other name under heaven by which we find salvation. I just think you might not remember that is a political story in which that verse is written. It's government leaders telling followers of Jesus what to do and what not to do. Keep going, verse 13. Now they, the government officials, observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Here should be our prayer in the middle of a political season that anybody who's watching us will not recognize who we vote for or what party we belong to or what stance we take on an issue, but that they will recognize that we've been with Jesus. May that be our identifier. They recognized them as having been with Jesus and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another saying, what shall we do with these men for the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it, but so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us Warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. Remember the original question: What if the biblical, uh, what if the governmental mandates we receive are unbiblical? What was the governmental mandate these guys just received? Don't ever talk about Jesus again. Verse eighteen. And when the government officials had summoned Peter and John, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Let me just translate that for you. You governmental leader just gave me a law, and I follow all the laws, but I'm not following that one. Because my God told me to share my story of salvation with others, and you can't tell me the opposite. So are there occasions when the subject yourself to governing authorities doesn't apply? Yes. When it's absolutely biblically clear that that government says A and God says B. But again, most situations are not so clear. That's why prayer is so integral to this whole process. They said, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So it says, when they threatened them, the government leaders threatened Peter and John further. They let them go finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man... 
the one who was healed, was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand... And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Finish it. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate. Who were those? Governmental leaders. Along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. And grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal. And signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had all gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. There will be times when the government says to do something and the Bible says to do the opposite and we will have to decide what we will do. And what will we do? We will say that we only have one king and his name is Jesus. And let me tell you how you can meet him too. Not to hate, not to condemn, not to curse or blaspheme, but to proclaim who our king really is. See, the quote is, rebellion against government ever justified. If a citizen has a choice between two governments, it is right to choose and to promote the one that is most legitimate in God's eyes, the one which will best fulfill God's purpose for governments. In a democracy, we understand that there's a sense in which we are the government, and we should not hesitate to help govern our democracy through participation in the democratic process. And the last thing I need to show you is one more passage where the same thought is given. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2. Different author toward the very back of your New Testament. This same guy, Peter, years later, the guy who was thrown in jail, we just read, for speaking about Jesus as Messiah. What did he write? 1 Peter 2.13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. You would think that Peter would be the anarchist. And he's not. He's the one saying, submit yourselves to the authorities for such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil but use it as bond slaves of God. And look at the last verse, 17. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So if you needed the four-point summary of Christian citizenship, you just got it. Respect everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, worship, be in awe of God, and honor the king. Honor the leaders. We don't worship the leaders. We respect them. But we worship the king whose name is Jesus. So let's finish with some reminders. We asked last week what can believers do in the political arena. We added a few for you this week. First, be informed about the issues. Pray for your leaders and your community. Be involved and let your voice be heard. Vote for candidates who best express biblical values. Run for office if God leads you. Obey governmental laws that do not contradict God's word. Never pay back evil for evil. And we studied Matthew 5 last week. Live as the salt and light of Jesus in our society. So we'll finish like we did last week. Question, if America held an election and one or more of the candidates for an office outwardly demonstrated devotion to Jesus and knowledge of the Bible, what should Christ's followers do? In God we trust. 
And if America held an election and none of the candidates for an office outwardly demonstrated devotion to Jesus and knowledge of the Bible, what should Christ's followers do? In God we trust. Psalm 40, verse 4. Remember it. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord, who has made Yahweh his trust, and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. You cannot pay attention to the political process and avoid those who are proud or those who lapse into falsehood. You can't. So let's ignore them and put our trust in the King of Kings. Put our trust in Yahweh, the God of the universe, and our Messiah, Jesus. Pray for leaders. Vote for leaders that best represent biblical values. Subject yourselves to governing authorities. But in God we trust. Would you bow with me? Let's pray. Some of our prayer team, they're going to come to the front. They'll pray with you here if you'd like. Our God, we give our nation to you. We entrust our nation to you. That you will raise up leaders. And God, we pray for leaders who are honest and courageous. Who express biblical values. But God, our allegiance is not to them. Our allegiance is to only the king of all kings. So, Father, may we never repay evil for evil. May we have love without hypocrisy. And may we continue to speak the name of the Savior so the world will recognize us as having been with Jesus. And we pray this prayer in his name. Amen. Blessings to you. Thanks for coming today.